took passion to be curious and inquisitive, chatty, or silent. Compassion does not turn it away. It is never afraid to see beauty or find humor or share a fractured heart. Compassion creates its own results as it interacts with the other. A new thing happens because compassion is prepared to yield to whatever happens next, always with the other person in mind. Compassion is a spiritual quality. To have compassion means to have full acceptance of each circumstance in life, and it's very difficult to achieve. Those who have compassion are usually those who have a great deal of varied experiences and self-exploration in their own lives. They have suffered, they have struggled with their own inner demons. They have met and known such a wide variety of people that have touched the humanity in each of them in so many different situations that they can no longer judge and reject neither person nor circumstance. They have come to realize that what life offers is that each of us is all of us. Their self-exploration has revealed the worst of their demons, so that when they see the demon in others, they can say, hello. Not push others away, but hold them close, no matter what is happening in their life. Compassion is about kindness and grace, and it's never a burden. Compassion is always welcome. It relieves the sick. It comforts the bereaved. It relieves the one who is burdened from the added burden of being of sorts of burden to the other. Have you ever met someone who says, I don't want to be a burden? When you are there for them, they understand that your being there is not a burden. It means that you are displaying compassion. Compassion can sit with the dying in silence or with one given birth, marveling at the miraculous element of both. Compassion can join in suffering and accept pain as a part of life. Compassion can urge us to jump into action. And if all of these qualities seem like they are an element of the divine, an element of God, it's because they are. And the only hope of ever calling this quality one's own is to remember that each and every one of us is created in the image of God. That is the way God created us, to be compassionate human beings, if we open our hearts and if we can look at others and see them for who they truly are. It's also tied to a much larger word, charis, or grace. 
This idea is found both in the Old and the New Testament. But compassion and mercy are oftentimes used interchangeably as they express the gracious action of loving kindness uh, toward another person. Compassion then would be similar to this idea of a broken-hearted response to need. And it is that broken-hearted need that moves an individual into that space where that need can be met. When I use the term need, we begin to speak about this idea of compassion because there's a brokenness in which compassion is addressed. That need has been created by a breach of what the, the concept of the scriptures describe as shalom. It's a Hebrew word for a comprehensive wholeness, a wholeness in relationship with God, in relationship to other human beings, and also in relationship with creation. So the Bible positions compassion as a response to need created by broken wholeness. And the Bible positions compassion as having its origin in God. We share an agreement. In the Old Testament, in the book of Genesis, we see God moving toward Adam and Eve in their need in chapter 3, where he initially inquires as to their whereabouts, really asking them a question that they realize what's just happened to them. God's compassion is moving toward them in their need. In the New Testament, Jesus Christ, the God-man, is the incarnation of God's compassion. God's compassion for a whole world full of broken shalom takes on flesh and blood in Jesus Christ so that through him, everything that has been broken can be made new or whole once again. In the New Testament Gospel, Jesus is depicted as exercising his compassion in a variety of different ways, through healings, through words, through interactions with people, healing not only the heart wounds, but the physical wounds that are decimating a creation that has been taken over by the challenges of evil and fallenness. Jesus himself resolves ultimately to put repair to this brokenness by being broken himself as the only sufficient act capable of restoring all things to their wholeness. You might see this interplay between compassion, mercy, and really justice as well in the following phrase that's taken from a quote by a gentleman by the name of Paul Tripp. He says, God's compassion causes his justice to wait and his mercy to act. And since God has decided to respond to his world with mercy, this gives us more of a call to be merciful ourselves. What we realize is the challenge that you and I step into a world of great need and attempt to exercise the effect of compassion toward those in need, but we oftentimes realize that our attempts are short-sighted. And so in the New Testament, what we see is Jesus being pictured this individual who did not come primarily to give us an explanation for or to help us cope in the midst of our trials. He came to conquer them once and for all, and that is the heart of true compassion as it's depicted in the New Testament. Before our next speaker, may I ask everyone who's on the edges to, if they could squeeze in, fill up any open seats so that people can sit on the edges. Translates into the dispenser of compassion. 
stating that Allah is the most compassionate and the one who gives out the most compassion. This is a perfect example of how compassion is a fundamental concept in Islam. The concept is repeated throughout the Quran multiple times in each chapter and recorded in multiple hadiths, which are teachings of the Prophet, peace be upon him, to show the importance and value of it. It is such a key concept that is shown in our five pillars. For example, when we pray five times a day, we practice compassion on ourselves from, by breaking from the chaos of daily life and allowing our souls to take a breather. When we perform Hajj, the holy pilgrimage, we have to be in a sacred state to where we can't even harm an insect. During Ramadan, the month of fasting, we withhold from eating or drinking from sunrise to sundown. This act shows and helps us understand the struggles of those who are less privileged. Not only is compassion embedded into our pillars, there, but there is a whole pillar dedicated to compassion. This is called zakat, giving to charity. If you are financially able to give, then you are required to give to those less fortunate. As you can see, compassion is in the roots and the base of Islam. Islam also teaches to never discriminate with compassion. In a hadith teaching of the Prophet, it states, be compassionate to the dwellers, and earn the compassion of he who dwells the heavens. Stating that one should be compassionate towards everything and Allah will be compassionate to you, compassionate to you in heaven. Meaning that regardless of faith, gender, race, or ethnicity, one should be compassionate no matter who or what they are. In Islam, Allah is the only one who judges, giving us our own choice to pick the path we want to be on. When we commit acts of good, we earn blessings. And if we do bad, they are counted against us. Basically saying that the total value of a person's life is the sum of their actions. These actions can only be measured by the intentions and efforts behind them. Due to this unique principle, there is no institution in Islam that is able to judge people's actions and good deeds besides Allah. At the same time, there is also no one voice that represents it. So everyone gets to decide how they want to live and each choice they may reflects their intention and understanding of right and wrong. In order to earn the compassion of Allah, each person must use their own understanding of right and wrong and compassion. Because we can have our own understanding of right and wrong, it is up to us how we practice compassion to Allah's creations making it a limitless concept. The Prophet, peace be upon him, taught us through his various life roles, being a leader, an activist, a teacher, that compassion should be brought into everything. It can be as small as picking up trash at a park or asking someone how they're doing or planting a tree for the future generations. We, as followers, are taught to follow and live closely by that example. Overall, compassion is a fundamental concept in Islam that we are taught to practice with each thought and action we make. With the idea of having freedom to choose our own paths, we as Muslims have a responsibility to treat everyone and every choice with compassion. I also believe that this concept isn't just important in Islam, but in all religions and practices of life. Especially with today's climate, it is crucial that we all practice compassion without discrimination. With that said, be kind to one another and always practice compassion with openness and sincerity, not with judgment or any biases. That's the best way to spread love and peace throughout the world. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, we have Jaspal Singh Gill, representing Sikhism. What is compassion? In Punjabi, it's called Daya. According to the Sikh Holy Scripture, Guru Granth Sahib, I quote, Daya jane ji ki kichpun daan kare which says doing good deeds and giving charity is a compassion and it's for, the, for the living beings. What is the purpose of compassion in Sikhism? To serve God. Our purpose in life is to serve God. To serve anyone, the most important thing is their presence. So to serve God, God must be present. So how do we find God? We turn to our holy scriptures. Guru Granth Sahib says to all religions, 
to find God, search your own holy scriptures. And once we realize the existence of God, then simply being aware of his existence, our actions are serving God. Well, does that mean that we're free to do any action we want? Well, as long as our focus is on God. When we are aware of the existence of God, then our actions are serving God. Our thoughts and, and all our actions are naturally reflect the attributes of God. And those, and those are truth, contentment, compassion, righteousness, and patience. Otherwise, our own self-existence, the thought of our own self-existence, takes over and projects the char characteristics of the self. And those are desires, anger, greed, attachment, and pride. Sikhs are to practice compassion in their daily life in three ways. One, through physical service called seva. And secondly, through financial help by donating 10% of your earnings to help the needy or for a good cause. And third, through prayer asking God for the well-being of all mankind, regardless of their faith, religion, or beliefs. This praying helps us as a reminder to be compassionate as we go out in the world every day. In summary, compassion in Sikhism means to serve God by doing good deeds and giving charity. Thank you. Up next, representing the Baha'i Faith, Hooper Dunbar. Well, it's a pleasure to be here this evening and to hear some of these marvelous truths that are proceeding from the scriptures of past religions. Uh, it's, I think it's very pleasing for a Baha'i. Perhaps you know the Baha'i faith was founded in the middle of the 1800s by Baha'u'llah, who was the founder and main teacher of the Baha'i faith, the revealer of its scriptures. And he proclaims that we have entered a new period in human history. And this uh, is very closely centered on the concept of compassion. Uh, as uh, has been mentioned here a few, in a few different ways, uh, turning to your scripture is the best way to approach God. And Baha'u'llah gives us the key to the uh, unity of all the religions. That is, he says that, um, first of all, postulating there's only one God, for all mankind, wherever they are. And this is the day in which mankind have to reconcile their, their differences through misunderstandings of the previous religions and realize that they're all the voice of God speaking relative to the time that the scriptures of the past religions were given. This is a, a major message of compassion because it, it goes beyond anything that you might consider tolerance to a full acceptance of the truth and reality and God-centeredness of all the religions of mankind, of all the world religions that we know in the past. So he, he calls us to recognize that this uh, truth that lies at the heart of all the scriptures of the past, if we investigate it, if we read it, we will encounter the compassionate God that's, that's at the heart of it all. And you will see that the teachings of the oneness of God, the imperative of loving God above all things, the importance of the soul 
and of its transformation. All of these elements continue in each of the faiths. At the same time, he said, the differences that have arisen between the faiths, and uh, with due respect to all the representatives here, we all know the problems of wars that have been engendered by religious differences and still are afflicting the human race. These are due, he says, to social teachings, which have to do with the requirements of the time in which they're given. So we see an evolution in the secondary laws of religion that is coming closer and closer to a general compassion. We don't have um, civil law still, that for the most part, doesn't embody uh, cutting off people's limbs and things that were not, they were part of the religion of God in the past when there was no government system, when life was tribal in character. And it isn't to criticize those, but the, the right of God is to give us a message relative to the time we live in. And Baha'u'llah calls all mankind to reflect on that and see that there's only one God and there's only really one religion, eternal in the past, eternal in the future. The second aspect that I'd like to just mention is he, he tells us that our view of humanity and the oneness and wholeness of the, of the human race uh, should be like the light of the sun. That is, the sun shines. It doesn't judge to see whether it's shining on the house of, of a criminal or of, a, of a, a just person or of a compassionate person. It shines. Its nature is to shine. And he said, for us to be able to embrace and love all mankind, we have to overlook the shortcomings of each other. If we focus on the shortcomings, we can find them in ourselves and in everybody else. And that keeps us, it separates us. So if we think that the love that we have for humanity is a reflection of the love we have for our Creator, the gratitude, the immense uh, joy that we have to exist. Uh, not so common now because we have such a materialistic outlook on existence is to realize that the very frame that we live in is a complexity of intelligence and order that we don't even penetrate yet, we haven't caught up with yet. Uh, the Baha'is don't believe that God is somebody that created the world and then he took a look at it and said, well, I don't know, it didn't turn out so well, or some of the ideas that just are sometimes here expressed but that rather he's closer to us than our life vein, that he is the cause of our consciousness, that consciousness itself is an emanation from the divine creator who's present throughout the universe and whose signs of existence and gifts are full on, both in our own souls, in our own lives, and in the universe around us. So he calls us to reflect on that and in that spirit unite for the good of all mankind and for the expression of God's compassion. All right, now we have some follow-up questions that have been put together by our class and there's no set order as to which they should be answered in or like how should they should be answered. So to start off, we have, what impedes a person from being compassionate? And you're welcome to open discussion. <laughs> what keeps a person from being compassionate? Yeah, what, 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 what stands in the way? What stands in the way? Yeah. I would say biases. Um, a lot of people just... Have the microphones oh, oh, yes. Is the mic on? <coughs> is my mic on? Can people hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, cool. Um, I think that overall, just kind of from what I said in my speech, was the fact that um, how we teach no discrimination in compassion. So basically, practicing compassion, withholding it, basically is having like a bias towards someone or towards something. Let's say like... For example, if I didn't want to help you out because of your faith, um, I think that the whole bias right there of you being of a different faith is holding me back from helping you out or you know, feeling the pain that you feel. 
you know, I, I think adding to bias, I think that there is, uh, there is distraction. You know, we, we, we live in a time where there's just a lot of, a lot of noise, a lot of internet, a lot of now that kind of puts us in so deep in this moment that we lose sight of what's, mm -hmm. what's around us. And, and I think also on, on the point of bias, uh, I think most of us today uh, like, feel, find comfort in the bubble of being with people who are like us, who believe what we believe, who see the world as we see it, and you know, you spend so much time just focused on that which makes you go like this, that anything that makes you go like this, you push away. And pushing away is the opposite of compassion, being able to accept people where they're at and understand where they're coming from and why they are uh, in the place that it makes it, makes it really tough. So we, we, we push others away, and the minute you're pushing others away, that's the opposite of compassion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's overcoming exclusivity too, that, that being, um, softening the edges of, of all of our communities so that we can share with each other and interact with each other, discover each other's truths. I think this is, is an essential aspect of the expression of compassion. And probably the two great veils that keep us from expressing compassion, there's generally, I think there's a fear in people of something that's different. You know, just think of the, what we have in terms of social classes. We have a bit of wealth and this person is down and out and it's, we maybe want to help but we don't really interact. I mean, you don't usually see people entering into conversation with homeless. They're, they've got everything we've got, they just don't have any wealth. And they, they need to, we need to share with our, our own spirituality, our own love share with all levels of society and overcome pride, self-importance, and passion generally are the great veils that keep us from reflecting God's compassion, if you will. Yeah, just to add to that, just the lack of communication amongst the different types of people that we are, even just you guys sitting amongst the audience, I don't know if like you guys are just sitting with your friends or people you're just comfortable with. Maybe sit with some random person um, and talking to them would increase your compassion towards others. Um, and when we're just like you're saying in that bubble or like on our social media, which I'm guilty of as well, um, it just definitely keeps us away from that human interaction that we need to increase compassion. One of the things that I have been like struck by over the course of my life is is the way in which I personally am oftentimes the impediment for compassion going forward and usually what's been required is I've had to come to deeper terms with my own personal needs yeah. my own personal inability to do what the situation requires of me um, to engage in a way that would uh, I've been oftentimes a problem I, I think we all. Yeah. Yeah, I it, think we're all well, guilty you know, of it. it it's, uh, yeah, I think different than what some heroes have, have expressed. Uh, I, I, I suppose by drawing ourselves closer to God in some big esoteric way, we, we, we can get closer to compassion. Mm -hmm. But but I also think it's very much a spiritual behavioral practice, and and all these things that we're talking about kind of get get in the way, you know, and and uh, you know. If you want to, if you want to become more compassionate, well, it's not simply a matter of opening up a book and reading. It's 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 really practicing how you behave towards others, how you listen, how you care, how you see, how you embrace, how you draw closer instead of push away. It's got to practice that. Prejudice is a big problem. We all have to address in ourselves different concepts that we've made that we see as the world progresses, as society develops, that we have to give up prejudices, political prejudices, religious prejudices, social prejudices, all of these race prejudices, all of these things are, are challenging us now. And I think because we really live, the earth is one country that we're living in, and it's just coming to grips with it now and becoming one human race under one God. It's really hard when, when there's bad people out there. It's just hard. It's hard. 
Fortunately, we don't have to do it alone. It seems <laughs> to be the will, the will and purpose of God as expressed in all the faiths to bring about peace and understanding amongst people. We live in his compassion. We breathe in his compassion. We, we exist because of him. <clears throat> right. And the next question we have for the panel how does your religion view other religions, and can religions work together to bring about peace? I think there would be, you know, we're obviously a part of a panel this evening, and, and I think it would be naive to conclude that we all believe the same thing. And, uh, you know, part of, I think, the ability of being able to work together, I would say the short answer on that question is yes. Um, but it also kind of depends a little bit in terms of um, as we're thinking about like how we work together, like conceptually. Um, I think that I think that kind of is a that's a challenge when we start to try to understand like what we're trying to bring toward one another in terms of the peace that we're trying to construct. I think uh, uniquely culturally, um, one of the things that I find myself dealing with living in a suburban culture in a fairly affluent area in North America is that the kind of peace that oftentimes we've settled for is a, is a peace that's really driven by um, a personal peace, which really means that I want to be left alone. And I don't really want to be inconvenienced um, by the challenges of other people, uh, if they're next door or if they're across the globe. I want to live life with the, the basic attempt at being uninterrupted. And whatever cost that incurs to my kids and to my grandkids, that's sort of the message that I'm trying to create. Unfortunately, I think that's the culture that I think we live in. And then the other thing is I think we use our affluence oftentimes to be able to drive our ability to isolate from one another. And in those conditions and isolation, as you were bringing up just a few moments ago, um, we don't make the greatest decisions when we're, when we're in isolation, not having to confront one another in friendship and love and basic interactions of hospitality. It's interesting that you, you, you kind of say that about isolation, because one, one of my big criticisms of certain kinds of interfaith cooperation, and, and I'm just speaking from a progressive Jewish perspective, okay, is that, you know, what I've seen is many religions uh, reach to me on issues for which we agree. And, and relationship often tends to be a relationship of political expediency. Uh, and I guess here in America, politics is everything. Which side are you on? You know, you're on this side or that side. You're on the right side or you're on the wrong side. Uh, you're on the red side or you're on the blue side. Uh, but if we really want to make a difference in this world, and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm looking past you down the line here. No, 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 um, in, in, uh, yeah. is, is I think we have to be able to learn to talk about those things um, on which we disagree. It's easy to find the people where there is alliance and, and, and relationship, and, and that's easy, you know, and, and, and you're friends until I guess maybe you have a disagreement, but finding those people where there's tough disagreements and having the courage and the strength to ask the questions and have the conversation, uh, that's when we can maybe have that breakthrough and maybe move humanity a little further down the line. Just um, staying in that bubble and, and staying connected with the people with whom you sort of nod your head and say yes, um, I guess it, it's, it's, it's easy in the moment, but I don't, I don't see great breakthroughs coming. Yeah, um, I totally agree with you on that. The fact that we do live in a safe bubble and we don't want to talk about this disagreements. I mean, Islam, as we all have seen in the media, is a very seen as a very controversial, you know, religion. And so, even amongst us in our own faith, when we have controversy, we don't even want to talk about it. So, if we can't even handle it in our own faith, how are we going to go out and talk to someone from a different faith that we may have a disagree with, you know, disagreement with or different views on? Because um, nothing, if we don't come together and learn from our differences, we're not going to learn because everything's just going to be the same. So. The only time change comes is when you have those difficult conversations with people. And that could be on any level, right? That could be just even talking about the smallest things about how we dress to the way we hold ourselves, you know? It could be, it's different. We're all very different. Um, so I think that I totally agree with you on the fact that once we start those hard conversations, that's when we can learn to get past these things and really work together. 
And if we come together, we can make a, whoa, did my mic go out? Okay. Um, if we really come together, we can make a really big difference. So I agree. How Sikhism views other religions is, Sikhism is not very big on uh, religious conversions, mainly because the Guru Granth Sahib, the Holy Scripture, says to, to everyone, be true to your own religion and realize the existence of God. So Sikhism respects all religions just the way they are. In fact, it seeks in their prayer, ask for, for the well-being and salvation for everyone regardless of their religion. Mm -hmm. I think we're talking about moving beyond tolerance. You know, it's just be one thing if we say we're going to all live in peace and get together because we have to put up with each other in order for there to be peace and order in the world. That's one thing. If we can, if we can raise this conversation to a level where because God loves us all and has created us all and sustains us all, as foreign as that is from the modern milieu of the moment, that gives us another basis to look at each other, to look beyond the differences, to not see the shortcomings of each other, so to speak, and to provide an inspiration through that love for others to follow. I, I think there's another element to it, and I, I agree with you, there's, a, there's another element, and I think it has to do with the very particulars of our, of our religions. Um, and it's, it may be a topic for another time, but you know, I, I look at, at you, right, representing Baha'i, and I've always wanted, you know, wonder, well, what, what does it mean to be part of a religion that, and, and I may characterize this wrong, which is why it's good to have the conversation, um, that's kind of moved past other religions, you know, and, 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 and perfected that which has come before. Um, I look at someone of the Sikh faith and wonder, you know, I, I really know nothing about your tradition other than what I've just learned to you, from you tonight and a few other things that I've read. Um, the relationship between Muslims and Jews is a, is a, is a fascinating uh, topic. And by the way, our communities have come together to try to, to address some of those. And I, and I think we've, we've, I wouldn't say stumbled, but, but, but hit walls when we come up upon some of the harder, harder issues. And in the Christian Faith, you know, if, if, you're, if you tend to be more on the progressive Jewish side, you have a relationship with Protestants, you, you, not the evangelicals, you know, and, and, and things like that. So how, how, do, how do we learn about each other and be able to push past those, those hard lines? Uh, it's, it's a challenge, and it, it's, it's, it's on us to even raise the issues before we can yeah. even solve them. We have to be able to acknowledge what those issues are. And, uh, and I, I, I don't want to like deflate the audience. I was going to say, yeah, we can all just come together and, and, and fix the world, but it's, it's not that simple. It, it, so. This is like this, a conversation of this type is a start for that because mm -hmm. we get curious about each other's scriptures. And when we look at each other's scriptures, we see the divinity in them all. Mm -hmm. And we, that, that, that's the, the basis of the resolution, finally, I think, of the differences that we have. Mm -hmm. We respect each other's faiths, but we also if we can conceive the idea of progressive revelation, like the grades in a school, uh, we, we'd have more respect, I think, for each other, the, the mass of the people. I mean, we're obviously, all of us, engaged in thinking about these things a lot, but many of the followers of the faith are st stuck in fairly fixed routines and have a prejudice against other faiths, you know, so. Sorry about that. <laughs> Must, must be true. <laughs> it's not my wife, so I have to turn it off. <laughs> um, All right, and then another question we have for you guys is, what is the biggest misunderstanding about your faith? And additionally, what is the biggest misunderstanding about religion and people of faith in general? I guess with Islam, it's like, where should I begin? Um, <laughs> yeah. Unfortunately, um, I mean, we are seen as uh, extremists. Um, a term would be terrorists. Um, you know, there's a lot of controversial terms about us. Um, and, you know, sometimes as just being a Muslim American, I was born and raised here. So my perspective of Islam is very different from even my parents, I mean, they're, they're South Asian, they're from Pakistan, she's in the audience. 
So, um, and pretty much the thing is that when I, the, how I was taught religion was very separate from like culture, pretty much. Religion was religion and my South Asian culture is my South Asian culture. And so my identity has different layers. But when I see, I mean, even just when I see as Muslims seeing like, I mean, terrorists happening, right? September 11th happened. That's, that was not the start of it, but there's plenty of that after, right? And when we were seen as, when that happened, I still remember my dad saying, I hope it's not a Muslim person. And when that happened and we found out it was, a, it was Muslims, we were like, <laughs> mind my language, crap, this sucks for us. Like now life is just gonna be really hard. And we're gonna have to live with that label pretty much almost for the rest of our lives now after 9-11. I mean, everyone sees us as turban heads or terrorists or, uh, or women when they cover their faces and they wear hijab and they wear niqab, which is the cover up of your face. They call us like ninjas. I mean, there's so many different derogatory terms towards us. And it wasn't because we did it, it was the extremists who did it. And I mean, we don't, half of us don't even really consider them real followers of Islam because that is completely against it. So, I mean, back to the question, there are layers and layers of uh, controversial things that we deal with on a regular basis, but the best thing we can do is be the best versions of ourselves and show our Muslim identity in ways that are just every day. I mean, half of you probably saw me walking, didn't even know I was Muslim because I don't wear hijab. You know, there's just, so many different ways and, and there's so many different ones, like people of us, like you could be sitting next to a Muslim and you don't even know, um, and unless they wear a hijab or something basically showing, like a symbol of Islam, right? So, I mean, I'm kind of going off on a tangent, but um, point is that we've had to live with these layers and it's, and I feel like I'm, definitely Islam is not the only one that deals with it. I know Sikhism deals with a lot of it. Um, also on our behalf, which, sucks so um you know it's it's tough like we're in it together so i mean we're all working together to even even judaism i mean i know there's a lot of controversial layers with that so i think just being religious is also being a form of being different from the common society and so i think when we're different back to what you initially said of being in our bubbles we get scared and we don't know how to deal with it and so when you come off as too religious or not as religious People, people within your faith will judge you and people outside of your faith will judge you. And it's, I mean, it's just, a, it's a difficult thing, but it's not an impossible thing to get through, I think. Sorry, a little tangent. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I think we're uh, sometimes fixated uh, with the outer look. So we never, we bother with pay attention to we miss the fun, what the fundamental beliefs are of that religion. And so, that's unfortunate. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think one of the great challenges, particularly for the Baha'is, it's not very well known. And the founder of the faith claims to be one in the line of these great revelators. And so his scripture is the scripture of our day. And it has the solutions from a Baha'i point of view, it has the solutions to all these differences and things that we're talking about here. But uh, if people out of prejudice won't look at it and won't investigate it, it's going to take the several hundred years that it took for Christianity and for Islam to spread and produce its fruit in the world. And that will be the proof of whether it is what it says it is or not. I think uh, for Christians, I mean, there's, there's a lot of similar um, challenges uh, uniquely. Um, there's a lot of clutter in the church. I think the church has uh, really uh, uh, suffered tremendously with a lot of scandal. Um, I think one of the difficulties in terms of understanding or misunderstanding the faith is that, um, and this is a really difficult one, most of the time I hear um, the critique of hypocrisy coming in, you know, toward Christians most frequently. And when I think about that, um, I could just ask my family. I can give you plenty of explanations as to my own hypocrisy in my own life, but I fail to live up to the things that I profess, um, and, and that's a challenge. But also the message of the gospel should also provide the critique for that and the correction and allow me to be able to step toward that in an exposing way personally. Um, I would also um, just suggest that a lot of times folks... Um, 
they gather conclusions about what the Christian faith is from individuals, and I don't deny that that should be the case, um, but the model, the, the example that we have is the person of Christ, and as, it's, as his life is described in the New Testament and the claims that he made uh, therein, and I think a lot of times folks will gather conclusions about individuals or by looking at a church from a distance uh, rather than investigating his claims at a personal level. I think from a, a Jewish perspective, it's, uh, it's complicated because we have thousands of years of, of tradition and of history and have different ways of moving through that history. Uh, so Jews come in all different shapes, sizes, colors uh, until uh, the most recent history, the last 70 years, we've been displaced from our homeland and we found places to live all over the world that has not been Home. So we, we've lived a life, as in a larger sense, in diaspora, as guests at the mercy of wherever it is that we have lived in any given moment. And that's part of our reality. And at the same time, we are blessed to be so comfortable here in America right now. And um, certainly in our community, and I guess that's what I would speak to most, is um, for better and for worse, the Jewish people just blend in. and. Listen, my, my kids went here to Granite Bay High School, and uh, the, the working assumption, you know, even though they're, they're, they were children of a rabbi and deeply involved in their Jewish religion, when people would look at them, they would just kind of assume they were, they, they were Christians, you know, they would, they would live here, and, 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 and nobody understood that, that they had a different story, different culture, different rituals that were part of their home life. And you know, that's a big burden to put on, on a teenager to represent an entire people and be one of seven people in a school. Uh, and, 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 and the school had an open heart, but, but somewhere between the open heart and how it really effectuated in everyday life was complicated. So tests would be given on our highest of, highest of holy days and, 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 and things like, like that. And, and, and of course our teachers and, uh, and the administrators were always very open to the conversation. But there was always such a big disconnect, not, not you know, well, why are you different? You know, I went to the dry cleaner the other, uh, a few weeks ago, and the, the, the dry cleaner was telling a story about uh, uh, taking down his Christmas tree. And he asked me when I, when I took mine down, I said, well, I actually didn't have one. He said, why? I said, well, I'm Jewish. Don't Jews have a Christmas tree? Well, well we, we really don't, unless they're so assimilated and they do, which is really part of the complication of living in different places in different, uh, different times. So it's, uh, it's, it's, it's tough. It's just the reality of how it, how it looks and how it feels. <clears throat> that is going to conclude the first half of this panel. We're now going to begin the second half of the panel. And just a, a reminder for all the students who are here for extra credit for AP Human Geo, after the um, panel is over, there will be IB World Religion students and they'll be able to sign off for your extra credit. And now for this format, um, some of these questions are directed for everyone and some are directed specifically at certain religions. So for the first question we have for everyone in the panel, this question comes from Daniel Green. Given your unwavering belief in God, are atheists accepted by God and can they experience a favorable afterlife? For, for, I'm looking at you because we're going to have polar opposite answers here. I'm just, uh, I'm just putting it out there. It's all right. Um, you know, uh, uh, wh whoever thinks I have an unwavering uh, uh, faith in God that doesn't, doesn't know me very well. I, I, be I believe in God. But actually the word Israel means God wrestler. That, to wrestle with God. That, that's what Jacob did the night before he had to reconcile with Esau in the Torah portion, and, 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 and he was, Jacob was given the name Israel. Israel is about God wrestling, about recognizing that uh, uh, faith can be tough and, and faith can be uh, complicated and wrestling is part of the, part of the journey forward. The other, the other thing is uh, Judaism is very much a uh, kind of a two-way, two, two parallel streets that hopefully come together. One, one street is that path of faith, of believing, of understanding what Torah tells us and teaches us, mitzvah, acting and behaving in the world the way that God wants us to. 
but there's another part of being Jewish, and that's being part of the children of Israel, part of the people of Israel. And, and I think this differentiates us from Christianity, and it's a good place to put it out here. In order to be part of the Jewish people, you just have to identify as part of the people. You can, you can say, I, I, I don't believe. I don't believe. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm an atheist. I'm an agnostic. I don't know. Or, or I reject completely, but you're still part of the people, so you're in and you're with us. And, and hopefully learning and growing along the way may create opportunities for, for intersection. So I wrestle with God, and I open my arms way, wide to uh, people to be part of our faith, even if they don't believe in God. Um, and I'll add, as uh, one of the great philosophers said, yet. So for Christianity, um, and then just for me personally, I would just simply say I'm in total agreement. My faith is a mess. Um, like, it can be all over the map, you know, given a lot of different things. And so when you speak in terms of um, the challenges of, uh, you know, atheism, um, not believing anything necessarily about God, I mean, that's a world that I, I think I understand something about. Um, but I also believe that of humanity um, is the image bearer, uh, male and female, of, of God, and that there is the reality that I do not live up to what I say that I profess. And even as an atheist, I, I think there's moments when atheists are insecure about their atheism. And uh, though they, you know, I think they have to be honest about that, just like I'm attempting to be honest about the fact that my faith in Christ is something that is a struggle point on a daily basis for me. Were you going to talk? Yeah, please. <clears throat> oh, okay. Go. <laughs> um, all right. Oh. So I guess my perspective, again, is not a, of a scholarly person, right? So, or a community leader. Um, so I, just, I know in the Gron, we accept all good deeds from all humans across the board. And that includes being an atheist or a believer or non-believer. So from my personal experience and from my knowledge, I, I believe that I am, you know, we're all we're all accepted regardless. Um, I know that when you do convert into Islam, you do say, you, you say that God is, uh, Allah is the only God and the, that Muhammad, Prophet Muhammad is the only messenger, um, essentially. And so, yes, that is said in when you convert, but I mean, I also think that there's, there's so many verses in the Quran that do say that when you are a non-believer, it still doesn't matter. You can still be, you know, treated as a believer, pretty much, is kind of what I'm trying to say. Um, so again, my knowledge is very limited on this because I am not a community leader. I'm just, you know, your average Joe here. So, um, but based on that and based on the things that I was taught in, you know, growing up, that was one of the things that, regardless of a believer or non-believer, you're still accepted. I think uh, faith should just bring, makes you interested but really you have to realize it until you re realize it yourself. And once you real, and that's what the scripture, our whole message is for the Guru Granth Sahib, that you have to personally, you have to realize the existence of God. God is present, who else is here? It's, it's actually we who think it's I am is the one that is the illusion, that's the misconception. It's really one God, that's it. And it's a, your personal realization. Once you realize it, you can't tell that to anybody. Besides, who are you going? Who are you going to tell? It's all, you know, it's all one. So it's recognizing, realizing the oneness that's one God alone that exists here. Okay, and so that that's what it's that's what basically it's all about. The realization. I think we can sympathize with atheists and agnostics because religion has gotten such bad press and mostly it's because of the human accretions the man-made dogmas and strange ideas that have been added to the basic scriptures which i do believe are all if you read across the whole whole of them they read as one holy book so uh, we have to realize that people have their limitations with it they say i i can't believe in a god that's sitting on some planet with a white beard and who rules the universe. <laughs> sorry, sorry about that. <laughs> Present company excluded. Yeah. Oh, so, 
in the Baha'i faith, you can't be a Baha'i without believing in God. But you have to believe that God is absolutely unknowable. There is no way to understand the essence of the universe. He manifests himself in these, in these God-men that bring the scriptures from age to age. And, and they accumulate. Now, most, most of, the, of the religion that at present, they stop with their founder of their religions. The Baha'u'llah accepts them all. To be a Baha'i, you have to accept the divine basis of Islam. And the Quran is one of the holy books of, of God's uh, education of mankind. We're all in the school of the prophets. If we could realize that, and also Baha'u'llah says that he's not the last of the messengers, that after a thousand years, another will come, who will adapt the religious, the secondary religious laws to the needs of that time in which he appears, which will be different. Christ could not very well call for the unification and oneness of mankind at a time when the earth was still flat, if you will, or when people believed they didn't know about America, they didn't have any concept at all. So there's some of these principles that they're the uh, crown, if you will, of social evolution. We've moved through tribal unity, family unity, tribal unity, city-state, nation, and now we're battling with the excess of nationalism as a humbug, really, to the, to the recognition of the oneness and wholeness of the human race. Paola says, the earth is one country and mankind its citizens. That, that implies that everyone should have equal opportunities to the wealth of the planet and to the organization of mankind. But it requires mankind to, to step forward and unite at another level politically and form a new order of so, society. So Politics doesn't seem to be helping the solutions. I'm, I'm wondering where the, the question that I'm sure all of us hear all the time, or many of us hear all the time, comes from them. Why, why, why would someone have to, why would someone say, you know, in, in order to have a place in eternity, if they believe in eternity, in heaven, and, and, and in, you know, in the possibility of the world to come, or, or, or even just in a place of acceptance here on earth, why, why, why do so many believe that they have to believe in order to be accepted? If, if all of us here uh, affirm at some level the struggle, I just find that an interesting question. You know, this seems to me love of self is one position and love of God is at the opposite extreme. And one doesn't, the one doesn't allow for the other. If you don't love God, you, you don't embrace the, the consciousness of his sovereignty, of his mercy, of his dominion, of his compassion, then uh, what's left is that you worship yourself, you worship your own ideas, you, you see that I have my, my perfect right to believe whatever I want, which is, is right. But I don't think any of the scriptures indicate that such a person will receive the rewards of heaven, certainly. I, well, I, I can just tell you in our, in our tradition there, there is a midrash, a text from 1700 years ago where the rabbis are, 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 are sharing examples uh, you know, of, of people who don't believe in God. And they decide to take it in the story to the maker, God's self. And they say, you know, so-and-so uh, uh, doesn't uh, believe in you. And, and God says, you know, I'm keeping an eye on him, and he's doing the right thing. So he doesn't have to profess to believe in me as long as he's doing yeah. the right thing. That's a very different uh, perspective. But it's also, I think it's clear, it's not over till it's over. Right. And people's lives change and evolve and the, and the views they have. I had a, a friend who was raised in Russia. He was in university in the 1920s. And he wasn't allowed to believe in God. And he was in university there. And he was a Baha'i. And his roommate was suspicious that he believed in God. So the roommate one day challenged him. He says, you know, I think you believe in God. He said, I don't believe in the God you don't believe in. Which is, that's, that's the main problem is that, how do you define it, you know? Einstein is made. I don't think that's the main problem, I think that's the main beauty. <laughs> I think the way Sikhism defines God is the one created, created you. 
let's just go with that. The one created you, that's fine with me. I'll go ahead and worship him too. Because he created everyone. He created everyone and everything. So if, as long as he's the creator of everyone and everything, that's the God we, we're going to look for. Yeah. So. I think it's fairly self-evident that there's a creation here, something created. If we know anything that exists that we know about, somebody's had to have made it. Right. And anything as complicated as the universe and the way it works with perf perfect interaction, mm -hmm. just the planetary systems and everything else suggests an intelligence beyond ours. Mm -hmm. The fact that we can't conceive it correctly mm. presents a problem. But then that's why you have Moses and you have Christ and you have Muhammad and you have mm -hmm. the leaders of the great faiths. Christianity de depicts a, a situation where we're dependent upon God to reveal himself to us if we're to be known by him. And the two main directions that the Christian faith like positions that revelation is occurring is first through creation and second through the special revelation of scripture. We've been, you know, for, for the Christian faith, that's the, the scriptures of the Old and the New Testament. And faith is positioned in those testaments as a gift coming from God himself and the requirement for that is is simply reception simply an awareness of your need and I think that need experience can come through a lot of different directions I think primarily it comes through an experience of broken shalom where you're looking for something to be set right you have a gut level sense that something is not right and it's into those spaces where God has historically worked through those situations to reveal himself in personal ways to people throughout the course of time. All right, so we have a question from Erica B. regarding interfaith relationships or marriage. So what are the challenges that you frequently provide counsel to for interfaith couples? So, so you're meaning, like, help me understand. So you're saying, like, when two people from different faith backgrounds are wanting to get married? Yes. Got it. I just wanted to understand what interfaith marriage was. I was just like, okay, that's a category. So. No, but, but I know, I got it. No, right, well, it's important for everyone to know, you know, I, sometimes interfaith means inter-Christian. Right. Right, you know, as opposed to different faith, different faiths coming, yeah. coming together. Um, in, in Judaism... Uh, I, I can't profess to answer, I can only really answer from my own perspective because there are, there are rabbis across the spectrum, you know, that 3,000 years of history and traditions that... Uh, um, I, I know that my role as a rabbi, one of my core roles as a rabbi is to do the work that, 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 that strengthens and cares for the Jewish people. So if a couple comes before me of different faiths and their commitment is Regardless of whether the non-Jew is going to convert to Judaism or not, if their commitment is to have a Jewish home and raise Jewish children, I will do their marriage. Um, if, if their commitment is to raise their children in separate faiths, I tell them I'm actually not the one to do your religion, because you do the marriage, because from my perspective, religion isn't really going to be all that important to your family. It may be important to you individually, like you like the color red and you like the color green, but, but, but religion is something that when it's done right, it can bring family together and create community. So if you're going to live two separate religions, I wish you well, I'm here to counsel, I can support, but I'm not sure that's best for the Jewish people. Uh, however, um, one, one other just addendum is I, I go so far as to tell people, and I've gotten people in my parents and of, 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 of our Jewish kids get mad at me for what I'm about to say. And what I'll say is, as a rabbi, I think religion should be important. So I want you to go study her Christian faith, and I want you to go study his Jewish religion. And what I would really love for you, if you're not going to be Jewish, is to pick one rather than pick neither. Because I think your, your family and, and your, 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 your potential children will be better served by having a faith that brings you together rather than something so core being so polarizing in a, in a family. So 50% of marriages in our culture end in divorce. I wish the percentage was different in the Christian church. It's not. Um, 
I definitely talk to folks about their, their backgrounds prior to getting married. Um, I typically, um, I will, as best as I can assess that, I'll marry Christians, or I have been asked to marry unbelieving Christians at times, but I'm very clear, like, you don't understand what I'm saying, like, they're, they're not Christians by faith or profession, but um, in, my, in the ceremony, um, the work and the, and the counsel that's done is in the direction of binding their consciences to Christ, because the metaphor in the New Testament in Ephesians chapter 5, the closest metaphor to explain the type of relationship that Jesus has with the church is the marriage between a man and a woman. And that's, it's a beautiful picture and it's a beautiful image and that's the direction of a Christian marriage. And so that's the basis upon which the interaction and the counsel and that sort of thing would be the encouragement for folks to live that out. And so when folks come to me, they're coming looking for a Christian wedding typically, and they're not looking for a wedding ceremony from someone else or a civil ceremony, so they're coming specifically from that perspective, and that's the perspective that I'm going to be offering to them and my counsel and then the ceremony and the service that I would offer. Um, so again, I don't counsel people, um, so I'm not authorized to do that. But um, I know in Islam that if you are a man and you're a woman of one of the faiths of book, basically if you're a Christian or, um, or Jewish, you can marry um, one of those women outside of being Muslim. I know as a, as a woman, you can marry outside of being a Muslim, but that person has to convert. Um, so from personal experience, a lot of my friends have actually married essentially non-Muslims and some have converted to the point where they'll just kind of convert and do the ceremony and just kind of call it and then kind of like what you're saying no religion is or one religion is better than none right so um you know i've actually witnessed uh imam aziz who is the lead imam at Tharbia institute and one of my friends actually married uh, a young man that was sikh and um so what they did was he converted first and then they had the wedding ceremony um, and Imam Aziz did both, which was really cool. And then I actually had another friend, like many of my friends are married outside of them, so clearly it's very common now, but a lot of their spouses have converted. Now it's up to them on their own whether they're gonna practice beyond that conversion at that time, or like that's, that's literally a journey between them and God. So you can, to answer the question, you can marry within a, or a different uh, religion, but the rules are a little stricter um, when it comes to a man, but. I mean, for a woman, it's, you have to be Muslim, I guess, essentially. So it's even more stricter. Uh, but, you know, again, it comes back to that personal person's journey. And I think, again, like what you're saying is one, one religion is better than none. Um, and so, I mean, again, personal experience, I've witnessed all of it. So um, they're all successful, thankfully. Uh, so, um, again, it's just, I think, just a different level. Yeah. There are quite a few interfaith marriages that take place uh, in the uh, Sikh temples. Um, I don't think they, as long as they're willing to go through that ceremony, uh, there isn't any requirement that, that they convert even temporarily. Um, however, the ceremony, the hymns that are read during the ceremony are basically they're, they're promising God to become one with God. Because if, they, if each person becomes one with God, then they become, that's the only way they can become together. Because you can't put, you know, you can see like a, two bodies, one consciousness, that's the goal. Um, you can't put the two consciousness together. The only way to do that is you just have aim. You, you aim for, the, for God, you aim for God. So that's, that's what they're promising and when they're going through that marriage ceremony. Well, in the Baha'i faith, it, you know, the faith is extended to 180 countries around the world, so it's very, very diverse in, in its origin, and Baha'is are allowed to marry whoever they wish to marry, but they have to get the consent of their parents from both sides. Parents don't decide who you're going to marry, a couple decides who is to marry, and at that point, they seek the uh, unity with the families because of the, that, that being so important uh, for the future of the grandchildren, for the families themselves. And it, the Baha'is have a simple ceremony in which the, uh, the pronouncement of the marriage vow is, we will all verily abide by the will of God pronounced by the, 
the, the two partners. But they can also then go to another church or another religion and have a ceremony of the first person of the other faith in the marriage. Uh, ideally, we're coming to this. As they turn towards God, as their spiritual life ripens, they reflect and unite with each other in a new way. And our next question again comes from Daniel Green. And the question is, given God's compassion for the people, why do good people experience extreme hardships and suffering? Hmm. Someone else could take that one first. Yeah. <laughs> so the, can you repeat the first part of that again? Given, given the, that God is, given God's compassion for all people, why, the bad people, why do good people experience hardships and suffering? So I'm, I, I'll, I'll just, I'll start out, evil is the bottom line. Uh, as the scriptures of the Old and New Testament uh, put it, um, evil is a part of the challenge of the fall. Um, it's part of what uh, Christ came to make new again or whole again. Um, we're not given a lot of explanation um, in the scriptures of the Old and New Testament with regard to um, the reasons for it and what happens. Um, but God introduces himself as the one who is able to use all of those things for his purposes to construct new life in a person. And uh, that's what we're given. Um, a lot of times in uh, my interactions and the way that I, I mean, bottom line, we have the why question. Why this, why that, why this, why that. The Bible gives the answer to the why question by giving the who, Jesus. So to answer with a person rather than an explanation is a very different approach, which again is intact um, at its core because Christ is the one who is bringing that wholeness in himself to the person that is wounded, broken, sick, and sore. Um, first off, Daniel's really deep. <laughs> That's a pretty deep question. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so, which is pretty cool. Um, I, I, you know, in Islam, I, I asked my parents the same thing about growing up. I'm like, well, why is, why do these things always happen to like good people? And their best answer, and the answer that we've all grown up with, is because God is testing you. He's pushing your limits, and He always tests those that are the strong believers, the ones that can handle it. Um, and so, I mean, I don't think there's a clear black and white answer, I guess, for this type of um, question um, that I guess I don't know about. But um, I would say that, again, like, and I, I do believe that. I believe that the people that are closer to the faith and when they're given a hardship, they pull out of it. I mean, you know, I've seen it with my own family. I've seen it with friends. And every time we always, we always pray for each other. The reason why we pray for each other is so God can help us through those struggles not everyone's good everyone is good yes we all have a little bit of negativity a little evil in us but i wouldn't say that we're all bad people we're all very good to the core everyone has a pure heart and we all pray together i think to god and we pray for those that are in those hardships and those people come out stronger you know and i think that's also as what my parents say too and what what again what i've learned growing up is that you're being tested your faith is also being tested at those hardships. It's not just, oh, like, God pick me, I'm being punished. It's literally like the fact that, you know, your, your faith to see how strong, how strong is your love for God. Can you get through this? Will you turn to God or will you turn to another means? So that's kind of how I've been raised and how I've seen it, and I think we've been taught that way as well. So, the reason that we're feeling hardship because we're focusing on ourselves. Focus on God, it'll go away. Simple as that, because that is the truth, is God. We have assumed our existence as a self. And that in, the, in Guru Granth Sahib is called Homme, which means, literally means the thought of I exist, I am. Once we do that, we separate ourselves from God which is the reality, and then we feel 
we feel everything. The existence of, of evil is one of the, uh, it isn't that God has created evil, it's the lack of good. It's like light is, is positive and darkness doesn't exist. If there's light, it goes away. So the same thing is this question of faith and trust in God is sharpened by the kinds of tests that come at us. Certainly endorse what you said from the point of view of Islam. In one of the uh, verses of Baha'i scripture it says, my calamity is my providence. Outwardly it is fire and vengeance. Inwardly it is light and mercy. That's a conundrum, but you see, you, I think we've all experienced in our own lives how difficulties in life, tests, actually increase the quality of our faith and the, the measure of our trust in Him. And I think uh, certainly in Islam, there's scriptures and in, in, in the Baha'i teachings too that says, God, merciful God never tests a soul beyond its capacity but it enhances the capacity through the tests. Mm -hmm. Now why is that? If we, we could have been, God could have created us all puppets, marionettes, or perfect saintly beings with no temptations or anything. It could, be, could have been that way. It wasn't that way. So we have this animal nature that we've been given together with a, the potential divine nature that is awakened through scriptures and through the saviors that we believe in. Uh, this, this allows us, for instance, how would we know what health is if there were no sickness? So how would, it's again, light is recognized because of, we know darkness, when we recognize light, if it's a continuum, we're not gonna understand it. So it's the same thing. The, uh, for, for me, the, uh, I think I already told Dan, I, I, I don't know why, I'm, I'm, I'm a God wrestler, you know? I, 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 I wish I had, I wish I had the answer, and I must say, many of the answers I've even heard here, some of it makes me want to nod my head yes, and if I, if I was in a combative mood, I can come right back at you with, with all the things that would challenge those, the, the, those positions, because that, that, that's, that, that's what I do. So I, 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 I don't let myself get stuck on the why question, because the why, and, and I know that's easier said than done, but the why presumes that I can know, that I can know the intention of that God who's unknowable. Oh. So, so, so the, the why confounds me. <clears throat> and the who is, is, is also not a question that I ask. Instead, I ask a question inspired by Rabbi Harold Kushner, who wrote a, a New York Times best-selling book called When Bad Things Happen to Good People. Not why, but when. And the question is, because of our faith, because of our community, because of our compassion, because of our relationships, how are we going to respond when? And, and that's, uh, th that's where I use almost all my energy. And certainly when people come to me for, for counsel, um, I, 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 don't try to, I don't try to say the why because I don't know. So one of the uniquely Christian pieces to this um, I think that I, I would, yeah, I just need to say it. I mean, part of the teaching of the scriptures of the New Testament just invite us to the conclusion that, that God entered into it, that God took on flesh and blood. I mean, this is a Christian story, that God took on flesh and blood and moved into our neighborhood, so to speak, and experienced the weight of that suffering, all of the miseries of this life and the difficulties of it in order to be near us and to make things new that have been broken. Alright, this question is from Bruce to Mr. Hooper Dunbar. Based on Baha'i beliefs, do you see religion changing again in a certain amount of time? And to others, can you too see faith or religion merging in the future or is history too deep? Yeah, I think I mentioned that uh, essential, one of the essential principles of Baha'i faith is that re revelation is progressive. There are two parts to religion. One is the essential scriptures, the eternal truths, and they repeat themselves and they're enhanced and enlarged each time down through the ages. And then there's the social teachings, which necessarily because humanity is progressing and changing in its outlooks and, and its views, social laws of all different sorts, 
uh, need a fresh expression in accord with the time we live. For instance, this is a Baha'i scriptures, the first scripture that proclaims the, that the equality of men and women, they should have equal rights and opportunities and privileges completely across the board. Now, that's 1870. There were no women with votes in the world, there was nothing. And the impetus of that principle goes out and acts in the world. The same thing, oneness of mankind. So I think that uh, uh, there will be uh, an, an adaption of this in the future, an elaboration on the eternal truths, but also we'll have new social teachings. And Bhavala promises that this is an eternal pattern. We'll go on, we're entering a, a long cycle of hundreds of thousands of years. So there obviously will be more and more prophetic teachings adapted to the times that we live in. Judaism, at least the Judaism that I represent, also believes in a progressive revelation. That, that, that actually is partially what difference, difference, differentiates me from my Orthodox brothers and sisters. Uh, those of you who see uh, our friends from Chabad uh, down on, across the street on, on Douglas, they are a much more Orthodox uh, uh, community. They, they believe that the entire Torah, all of God's wisdom was given at Mount Sinai in both a oral form and in a written form. Later, <coughs> 1,500 years ago, the rabbis wrote down all the oral tradition and it's set in stone. Um, a more progressive Judaism, a reformed Judaism, which is what I represent and where I come from, is that uh, uh, God is always revealing to us. And, 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 and that, that, that's why I can live a modern Jewish life because God has something to say to me today that is different than how those in biblical times under, tried to understand what it was that God demanded of them. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I, that means I can read my Torah in a non-literal way. And I can read it as an attempt in that day for those people to say, well, what did God want for us then? And just, you know, you asked, someone asked a question about intermarriage. Uh, for me, that, that also gives me permission to say that, hey, my Torah's words about homosexuality don't speak today. There's a, there's a different perspective because we understand more about what it means to be a human being in this world and what it means to be created in God's image. So while the Torah may call a gay person an abomination, I would welcome them to sit in front of me and talk about the marriage that I could do for them to sanctify the commitment they make to each other. That is progressive revelation. This next question is for <coughs> Sarish Khan, and it was asked by Bella DeChico. What is the significance of veiling in your religion, and is it necessary? Veiling like the hijab? Like the yes, head cover? Yes. Okay. So, um, yeah. All right. <laughs> okay. um, uh, so, was the question that is it required, or is it necessary? Is it necessary? So, in Islam, uh, you know, we, produce, we promote a lot of modesty dressing. I mean, as you can see, I'm a pure Muslim woman not wearing a hijab, which is the veil. And for me personally, hijab isn't just covering my hair. Hijab is a, is a lifestyle and it's a lifelong commitment. And so eventually, uh, again, it kind of it, it is a very progressive to extremes. Um, but on my personal level as a Muslim woman, I believe, like I said, is a very lifelong commitment. And so in Islam, we're supposed to be covered from, you know, basically my, from basically all the way down to my, like how I'm sitting right now. And the main part of a hijab is to cover up your chest. It's not necessarily to cover up your hair because that is the most attractive feature and for men and it gets a lot of attention. So, I mean, if you're dressing modestly, personally, if I'm dressing modestly here like I am today and I'm not revealing myself and I'm not uh, objectifying myself as a sexual object, then I personally think that the way I'm dressed is fine. Now there's multiple people that will probably totally disagree with me because I actually have my sister-in-law, she wears hijab. And you know, hers, even in hijab, there's different levels of hijab. Some women wear it as a turban and they don't cover their chest. Some will, you know, wear the whole thing and cover their faces. Now, in Islam, you're not supposed to cover your face. That is, that is not, that is an extreme um, idealistic and culture. 
um, you're actually always supposed to show your face. But, you know, my sister-in-law, she does it in a very different manner. She does it in a very uh, progressive way, I would say, because when you're walking around, especially in today's political climate, as a Muslim woman, if I'm wearing hijab, it's, it's, it can be seen as a target, right? I mean, we've all seen the YouTube videos and the Facebook videos of people pulling hijab. It literally happened to my sister-in-law, who wears hijab. She went to a Pete's in California at Walnut Creek, and some lady, like, yelled at her for wearing hijab. So, I mean, again, it is a lifestyle, it's a commitment. I commend her for it. I commend all my friends for it. But I think personally right now, I'm not there yet, but, um, you know, it, it, some people, it is a requirement, uh, I think. Um, but from what I know, it's also a personal journey to get there. And for me personally, I want to get the basics down of praying five times a day, doing my five pillars, diving deeper into the religion. And then, you know, with God's blessings, I will commit to that and cover my head. Um, so I hope that answers it. <laughs> and then the next question is for everyone. What is the significance of rituals and tradition and religion? Um, what is the question? Can you repeat that again? What is the significance of rituals and tradition in your religion? I think we need to distinguish between scripture and add-ons after. <laughs> you know, that's one of the things that's dividing us is the, are the rituals that have been added, man-made creeds and things that have been added to scriptural basis. Even within the f different faiths you have these differences because of, uh, because of ceremonies and, and rituals like Christianity, Orthodox Christianity, Catholicism, all the Protestant branches. So I think we need, if we're going to, um, there are some rituals that seem to be prescribed in scripture. My faith has minimal rituals, but it does have a prescribed daily prayer. Islam has the same, same thing, and a fast. But it's a little different in form than with Islam. But again, in require, with respect to the requirements of the day we live in from the Bible perspective. For, for us, I mean, Judaism has a lot of rituals associated with different holidays. Uh, the, the, the Sabbath, study, wearing a, a yarmulke, a kippah, uh, lighting candles, saying blessings. Uh, the tradition is supposed to say at least 100 blessings a day. Uh, I, I think the purpose of ritual in our tradition is to uh, create opportunities for those who are looking to draw closer to God, to, to appreciate the world around us, and to, to be able to speak the words and, and go through the motions that for that person are drawing them closer to God. Uh, I, I think in, in, in the thousands of years of history and traditions and thinking particularly about my own family holidays and celebrations, those rituals draw us together and draw us to community and, 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 and bind us together hopefully to come to appreciate what our tradition and faith is, is all about. <coughs> I think to your point, to me it's not whether it's scripture driven or not. To me, it's, it's recognizing that it's there for a higher purpose. So if, if the tradition is uh, to all come together for a, happy, uh, for, for a holiday and share a meal and then yell at each other, um, I would say that's probably a tradition worth getting rid of because that's not drawing you closer to God and it's not bringing family together. Uh, but uh, that, that, that's the progressive end of things. But, but the, the traditions are really meant to, to, to bring us together and draw us closer to God. And there's a lot of them. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you. Uh, the whole point, I think, in, in Islam, and I think even all our religions, is these traditions and rituals bring us together. It, in, it increases unity amongst all of us. Um, you know, when we fast in, in Ramadan, we go to the mosque, and at night, there's so many different activities that we'll do. Like, we'll all pray together. We'll even eat in the morning together. We'll break our fast together. Like, the, during that month, it is such a moment of unity and so much traffic in the mosque it's beautiful and we love it because it just brings it and we also do like interfaith you know iftars which are which is when we break the fast and it's also not just being our people of our faith but others out there so you know again it's it's a higher power it's a higher thing and the, i think the biggest thing coming out of it the best objective would be to bring just unity amongst everyone yeah i agree with that it's basically it's a social event bringing pe people together 
because we are not to just sit in a cave and worship God. This is his play right here. This, this whole world is his play and the stage. And we got to just uh, sing and dance and uh, enjoy and be part of the community. So that's, I think, what it, rituals means. That's, that's what they are. I think some of what's, what goes on in the Christian uh, tradition, just as an honest assessment here personally, we all have liturgies that we go through each day, whether that a cup of coffee or you know whatever that is, we have like liturgy. And uh, I just would say that those liturgies have a shaping effect on our lives. And for the Christian faith, um, obviously there are liturgy uh, to a relationship with God, reading, taking in the Word, spending time in prayer, uh, fellowshipping with other uh, followers of Christ, and it's it's just a part of it is a part of what we do. And the, the 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 shaping aspect of that is the is the piece that's critical for for our for our background. This next question comes from Lamont Mason. What is the meaning of life, and why are we here? Unfortunately, we don't have too much time left to answer this question, <laughs> but you guys can do your best. So we all have, I'll, I'll strike first, we all have catechism um, as a part of what it is for my particular lane in Protestant um, Christianity. Uh, the first question of the Shorter Catechism of the Westminster Confession just simply asks the question, what's the chief end of man or mankind? And it's to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. Um, that's the first question and response answer. Well, I think I have already mentioned it before. It is the purpose is to here to realize his existence and then just enjoy it. And then just being aware of his existence and then do whatever you want to do. Playing tennis, doesn't matter. Whatever you want to do, <laughs> think of him. Just has it. He lives there, not you, as a self. That's it. Well, my point of view is the same that you've all expressed: is to know and worship God through scriptures, which are the means by which we learn about God. The book of God teaches us about the book of creation. It. Uh, it explains, calls attention to the fact that everything around us are signs or tokens of the greatness of God's creation. So we read the, he said, read the book of scriptures, it will reveal to you the book of nature. Look at the book of nature, it will confirm to you the, the reality of a, of a creator and the source of his mercy. So basically, that's the purpose of life. And to prepare the soul for the next life is I think that's repeated in all the great religions too, quite clearly, certainly emphasized in the Baha'i teachings. We're really pilgrims on the way. We're not, this is not the final goal. And to have a good time here is not the purpose of existence. You can have a good time, be happy and joyful. But recall that there's something more to it, that this world is a womb, the same as the womb of the child prepares the child to be born into a physical existence. This physical existence needs to prepare the spiritual means whereby we live in the spiritual realm after we pass. And it's interesting all the near-death experiences that are kind of hinting at this in a very revealing manner, really. Um, first off, Lamont's even deeper than the other kids. <laughs> so, um, uh, you know, in Islam, this life is temporary and we work hard to like you're saying to go into the next life which is the afterlife this is a big test for us we work hard we be our best selves we enjoy life we embrace god we embrace god's creations we respect god's creations whether it's human or the environment you know we're always showing our best selves forward and we're working hard for this so this life that we're working for, we're well rewarded in the next life and we'll enjoy that, you know, even more than we're already enjoying this. So, you know, the meaning of life here for us is just, you know, it's, we see it as a temporary thing, but even if we're seeing it as a temporary thing, we're going to work hard to be the best versions of ourselves and respect everyone around us and embrace God, like I said, and, you know, be rewarded with the best that we can in the next afterlife. 
I think you're going to shut us down. And I would like to say on behalf of all of us to thank the the class that's prepared these panels. I mean, it's given us a very thought-provoking, interesting <laughs> evening. And thank you very much. Well, fortunately, I'm not shutting you down yet. We're going to give you uh, the last few minutes to have uh, share any closing statements you may have for the rest of us. I mean, I wasn't prepared. But, uh, I guess the closing remark that I want you all to remember with Islam is that we're not a scary religion. Um, I know despite what media has shown you, and I commend all of you to be out here. I know it's like a school requirement and it's a school night and there's a lot of good TV out there, but you guys came out here, you listened to all of us. And having this discussion with you all was very, it was my first experience doing a panel and I just feel that it's great that we're creating these you know, discussions. So there's people out there breaking the stereotypes that we have for our religions. And so in Islam, you know, we're always here, open arms. I think we're actually all of it, it's not even just Islam. All of us, our religions are here for you, open arms to have these discussions and, you know, break through these barriers. And like all the other questions related to, can we all work together? If we create more events like these or have these discussions, we will eventually work together. And you guys are our future, like you guys are the future generations. I know right now it doesn't matter and your teachers say this, trust me, I was sitting right there mm -hmm. and I was like, you guys are just talking. I don't even know what you're saying. But eventually, I, you know, now that I'm up here, I see it. And having these discussions is very important. And you guys need to have these. Social media is big. If you can pull it out through that way, that'd be great too. Like, you guys have more avenues than even when I did. Um, not that the internet wasn't there when I was there, but, um, you know. So, point is that just be nice to each other and talk to people that are different, accept difference. And back to my original point, compassion doesn't discriminate, and you guys shouldn't either. Uh, I, I'm just going to say amen to that, really. That, that, that <laughs> said, you know, the, for, for us, uh, life uh, it takes us to a passage in Deuteronomy that says, choose life so that you may live. And uh, if we can go back to how we started our conversation, live with love, live with compassion, live with a little bit less than self and see and care and love people around you, uh, we can maybe get to a better place than sometimes it feels right now. Okay. Pretty well said. I think we all agree reality is one thing, truth is one thing, and the more we seek it out and investigate it, the more we come together. Can't be multiple truths with respect to creation, you know, we're living in the same creation. I think it's good that uh, I think it's great that we're having inter interfaith discussions, and I think that we do need to read other holy scriptures, explore. You know, that's it's only gonna make you understand your own scripture better. I would even start a motion to start a church called inter Church of Interfaith. I just want to say thank you. Um, thank you for you all setting this up and for the opportunity just to be able to be here to try to sustain a little bit longer con conversation um, than is typical in our community. And I'm really grateful for that. Thank you so much. And that is going to conclude our interfaith panel. I'd like to give a big thank you to all our speakers. Thank you for being here. I'd also like to give a big thank you to the theater department. Their play is still going on this week, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. Starting at 7, you should go see it. The theater department is great here. Um, and also like to give a big thank you to all the students from Ivy World Religions who put this panel together. And a big thank you to Mr. Taster. And thank you all for coming, and thank you for the food donations. And also, if you came for extra credit, you can get uh, your signed off by any of the students or Mr. Taster.